All in all, impressed with the ease of information discovery in terms of accessibility at the Paris Olympics. Also really impressed with the creativity, thinking outside the box, providing things that could be useful and really elevate the experience that someone is able to have, giving them as much of a, an equal opportunity to have a great experience as a non-disabled attendee. The time and thought and care that went into transportation, actually getting people to the Olympics, then comfort and safety once they were there. I'm impressed by it. It was encouraging to see and also exciting to see how much emphasis and, and resources were put towards accessibility. Welcome to Chez Jeunesse, the place of new beginnings. My name is Katherine Hubert, and I founded and own a French-inspired cafe where, as a team, we are on a mission to change the way that our world understands neurodiversity and employs humans with disabilities. Our restaurant was born and is based in Greensboro, North Carolina, and that's where we practice and teach our mission and model. This is our channel where we dive in deep to who we are, what we do, and why we do it. Our hope is that this content is empowering to disabled and non-disabled humans alike, and that no matter what perspective you are coming from, employer, employee, parent, friend, or Shazeness fan, you feel welcomed, you learn something new, and you walk away with a deeper appreciation and understanding of humanity. Hi everybody, welcome back. I'm so excited to have you here today. The Olympics, the Paris Olympics, I know have been all over all the news channels and people have been avidly watching. It's been really fun. I haven't been able to watch it all live, but I've been watching clips here and there, which has been super fun. So today we're here to talk about accessibility at the Olympics. The Paris 2024 Olympics actually has had a really big push towards accessibility for participants, no, not participants, for viewers, is that what you would say? Attendees, that's probably the better word. There's been a really big push for accessibility for attendees with disabilities. That has been really interesting to dig into this week. So I'm gonna talk about a few different components of what that has looked like, at least in terms of the research that I have done. I'm also gonna show you a little bit of how I do that research and what I'm looking for so that as you are doing your own traveling, exploring, participating in events, things like that, just even internet searches and looking on, on different websites that you can kind of see some of what I'm looking for when I'm trying to gauge how accessible something is. But overall, I would say the Paris Olympics has done a really creative job at being accessible. I'm impressed by the level of thought and care that's gone into the accessibility features for the Olympics. So we're gonna dive right into that. First of all, a few differences. One, the Olympics is currently going on, which is what everybody is talking about, but the Paralympics starts at the end of August and goes into the beginning of September. That is also being held in Paris. So they are hosting both the Olympics and the Paralympics. And then there is something called the Special Olympics. Both the Paralympics and the Special Olympics are for athletes with disabilities. The difference between those two is that the Paralympics is for athletes with physical disabilities and the Special Olympics is for athletes with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Sometimes that may also include physical disabilities, but the, the key difference there is Paralympics for physical disabilities only, and then Special Olympics for athletes with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Physical could be part of that, but the intellectual and developmental needs to be present first and foremost. So. Those are the difference. Today we are going to be talking about the Olympics and the accessibility at the Olympics. And then in the coming weeks, we will probably also be touching on the Paralympics since at that point we will get to see, this, this is talking about accessibility for disabled viewers and attendees of the Olympics. In a few weeks, we'll jump in and we'll talk about the Paralympics where we're going to be exploring more of what it looks like for disabled athletes who are competing in the Paralympics. Just wanted to make that distinction. If you've been around here for a little bit, you know that I love to Google things. That is one of my favorite things to do. I am forever grateful for the internet and the easy access that we have to information. I'm constantly looking things up because I'm constantly having questions and I'm curious about things that are happening in the world. And I love being able to, to type things in 
and to start a search and to follow those trains of thought and see what happens. So that's what I did this time. Started out initially by searching in YouTube, actually disability representation at the Olympics. Realized pretty quickly that that actually wasn't gonna be the right topic for this video, that that would be better suited towards Olympics that are geared towards athletes with disabilities. I was curious to see if there was any crossover with the Olympics, but didn't really see much. So then narrowed it down to actually let's talk about what accessibility opportunities and offers are being presented at the Olympics for people who are attending who have a disability. So then doing that, Google accessibility at the Paris Olympics 2024. One of the first things that popped up was the Olympics website where they talked about how they support the campaign We the 15, the 15 standing for the 15% around the globe of people who have disabilities. The US ratio is about 25% of the US population has a disability. Globally, about 15% of the population has a disability. I think that number actually probably is a little bit higher, but my guess is that there are areas where medical care and diagnosis aren't being aren't as readily available and so that may skew the numbers a little bit but the paris olympics 2024 are supporting the campaign we the 15 which raises awareness promotes visibility integration accessibility inclusion etc for people with disabilities and there's a big push within the school system of the host site of the olympics to learn about accessibility, disability rights, inclusion, et cetera, what it looks like for disabled athletes. So that was something that was also exciting to learn, that it's not just something that the Olympics itself is supporting, but that the We the 15 push also provides a lot of education within the school system for the host cities of the Olympics. So that was exciting to see. And then from there, started started digging a little bit more and found that there's information both on the Olympics website and then there's a lot of information available on the Paris Jetem website. So more of the Paris like tourism website and then the Olympics website itself. Both sites have great information. There's some crossover between the two of them, especially when it comes to transportation and accessible transportation. But overall, the first thing that I wanna point out is as I was doing these searches, it was very easy to find the information. And that is a big piece of accessibility. Oftentimes an accessible option may be available to someone with a disability, but it can sometimes be really hard to find. We talked about this earlier in our video about Nike and performative allyship. Nike does have some offerings for disabled humans and athletes, but they're very hard to find on their website. And you kind of have to go down all these rabbit trails in order to actually locate the information that you need. So that's not very accessible <laughs> because you're having to take a lot of extra steps or or clicks or phone calls than a person without a disability would have to. That's the first thing is that all of this information was really easy to find. It was easy to navigate on the website and things were very clearly stated and outlined. So number one, check, great job with that. In terms of things being offered, there are a few accessibility features in particular that I really want to point out because I hadn't heard of them before. And I think that they're just super cool. One of them is a vision pad, and this is only for a few specific sports, rugby, basketball, and I think tennis were the three, and this is available for both the Olympics and the Paralympics, but there's a vision pad for someone who is visually impaired or blind, and you can actually track where the ball is on the court with your finger on this pad, and the pad vibrates and the vibrations increase as the intensity of the game increases as well. So you're able to track not only where the ball is on the court, but also how intense the game may be, which I thought was a really, again, like creative use of technology and way to allow someone to enjoy and participate in some of the elements of the game that they might not otherwise be able to. They also, there were several offerings for, for people who are visually impaired or blind. They were vision helmets as well, braille guides available, and closed captions are also something that's going to be available or has been available during the Olympics. So that was super great. The 
Paris Je Tem website also had a whole document on accessibility features, a guide, like a guide to the Olympics, and each page of the guide was also interpreted. I'm not sure if it was ASL or if it was French Sign Language because I'm not fluent enough. I don't know French Sign Language at all, and I do know some ASL, but there's crossover between the two. So I'm guessing it's one of the two, but I'm not quite well versed enough to be able to tell you which one it was. But each page of the guide, it's done digitally, and each page someone was interpreting the information. And so I thought that was a great feature that was available for deaf viewers and attendees. There's a lot of transportation accessibility factors, not only listing what all of the transportation options are, but then there's an accessible shuttle that also runs between bus and train stations. The long and the short of it is there's an accessible shuttle that's available to take people between metro stops and between the train stations. So that can be really helpful, especially if you're having like you don't have a direct connection, you're needing to stop here and then get to the next the next stop. So there's a shuttle to assist in the way. There's also an opportunity to motorize your wheelchair. And then there's accessible seating available. So they were expecting about 28,000 attendees with disabilities at the Olympics. Tickets were available specifically for accessible seating and people purchased their tickets to attend. All in all, impressed with the ease of information discovery in terms of accessibility at the Paris Olympics. Also really impressed with the creativity, thinking outside the box, providing things that could be useful and really elevate the experience that someone is able to have, giving them as much of a, an equal opportunity to have a great experience as a non-disabled attendee. The time and thought and care that went into transportation, actually getting people to the Olympics, then comfort and safety once they were there. So all in all, I'm impressed by it. It was encouraging to see and also exciting to see how much emphasis and and resources were put towards accessibility. And then lastly, which it doesn't, this doesn't necessarily tie into accessibility, but also just want to comment on how impactful it was to get to see Celine Dion perform as part of the opening ceremonies. If you haven't watched her movie, her documentary that came out recently, where she talks about being diagnosed with stiff person syndrome and how that's impacted her ability to perform and her ability to sing. Part of stiff person syndrome is that when her brain gets overstimulated, then her body starts to shut down and some of that can include seizures. And during the documentary, it showed a seizure that she had and also just grappling with what does it look like that to have her career impacted in the way that it is. And not only that, but just her love of singing and love of performing. I know there was a lot of talk about like this being a comeback performance for her, but that hit particularly strongly after watching her movie and just seeing the grief that she has experienced in not being able to perform. So then getting to see her and getting to, it seemed like the emotional impact that that had on her and her life as well was also something that I just wanted to take note of. That's it for this time. If you have questions, thoughts, please drop them below and we'll be back next week with a different topic, but then again in several weeks when the Paralympics start. Chasing us teammates, your keyword for this week is athlete.